Chapter 24, Artemis Finds His Treasure The Exeter slid gently up the waters of the northern Potomac, creeping along with trimmed sails, until she reached the farthest point north that McGregor could find, that would put her as close as safely possible to the old capital city, without running aground on some unseen obstacle. The sun was high in the sky, and the weather was nearly perfect on this early autumn day, as McGregor once again called for a depth reading from his assigned crewman on deck. For fathoms, sir, yelled one of the seamen below. Very well, keep an eye out for shoals, they'll be coming up soon, yelled McGregor as the exeter continued up the river. McGregor eyed the shoreline as the ship sailed past what had once long ago been a large sprawling metropolitan airport. Now, there only existed remnants of decayed and rusted-out buildings, along with trails of broken-up runways and railways, overgrown with weeds and tall grasses. The advantage of this location was that he could see clearly for miles in all directions. However, the disadvantage was that it would also prove to be a constant reminder to McGregor of the frailty of man as much as to the futility of the vain monuments of government. In almost every direction, as McGregor gazed with his binoculars, he could see glimpses of the great America of the past, which until now, he had only been able to see and read about in picture books. To his north lay the ruins of the Lincoln Memorial, to the west, the old Pentagon, and somewhere out to the northeast, most likely buried under layers of mud and silt, would lay the ruins of what may have been the most famous house in the world. Ease off the mains, and prepare to lay anchor, yelled McGregor, as the exeter crept underneath the steel and concrete remains of the old 14th Street Bridge. Captain Artemis, this is about as far in as I dare take this ship. Time to lay anchor, I say, unless you want me to start scraping up the mud, we're getting into shallow water, insisted McGregor, as he continued to monitor their progress with both his eyes and well as his binoculars. This should do nicely, Mr. McGregor, nicely indeed. Send up a flare as soon as we're stopped, and then we sit back and wait for signs of my father's team, commanded the voice of the young female standing behind him, who had also been closely monitoring the exeter's progress. Acting Captain, Catherine Artemis, was the twenty-year-old only daughter of Henry Artemis. As beautiful as she was intelligent, having her mother's looks and father's love for the sea, she had been born and raised all her life on sailing ships, and she knew them as well as any man twice her age and had no qualms to have proven that on many occasions. McGregor, who had practically raised her and was like a second father to her, knew better than to ever misjudge her. He had made that mistake many times when she was a young girl and found out just how determined she was to prove herself. No, not a sailor aboard would have ever dared to question or challenge her authority, fearing not only her wrath, but that of McGregor's as well. Kathleen patted McGregor on the back. Well done, Mr. McGregor. Now we've done our part, declared young Artemis, walking over to the starboard side, continuing to scan the horizon for signs of her father's team from the fortune. Well, Mr. McGregor, if all is going well, they should be done with all the vaults by now. Then we'll find out if my grandfather's information was correct, Catherine speculated, as she continued her search of the shoreline for activity. Well, Miss Artemis, I've never in all my life known your father to go on any wild goose chases without first checking all of his facts, noted McGregor. Tell me, Mr. McGregor, what's it like in the old city? You were there just a few months ago, weren't you? Yes, I was. I went in with the second group, continued McGregor. The more they can avoid those old subway tunnels below the city, the better their chances of success, I'd say. Catherine sighed and turned to McGregor. I remember reading the reports about finding all those pale-skinned, red-eyed feral people living in those tunnels, she continued. So, how many do you think are actually living down there, mister? McGregor? She asked, cringing slightly at the thought of it. McGregor scratched his beard. There could be thousands of them living down there, I'd guess. Thousands. McGregor's voice slowly trailed off as he returned his attention back to the matters of the ship. I just saw the flare from the Exeter, sir, announced Heinrich, who had found an observation point at the top of a nearby building, one of the few tall buildings remaining that was still fairly intact. Everywhere he turned to look, he could see the devastation around him below. 
He could only imagine what it must have been like that afternoon so many years ago to have stood on the very same spot and watched as the tidal wave from the Atlantic Ocean violently swept in and took their toll on this once great city. The voice of Mr. Deeks calling out from below him jolted Heinrich back to reality. Very well then, Mr. Heinrich, we're just about ready to set the first charge down here. Signal the others to stand by. In five minutes, hollered Deeks, quickly returning to the inside of the vault to supervise the setting of the first charge. Heinrich sent the signal, then continued making observations of the area, wondering if it would be safe or not to be standing where he was as the charge went off. Too late now, he thought, as somewhere below, he heard the muffled thud of the explosion and felt the vibrations underneath his feet. He grabbed tightly onto the side of the building for a moment, as if that would help save him, should the building happen to collapse, then suddenly he realized the danger had already passed. If the building would have collapsed, it would have done so by now. Far down on the ground below, he could see the wagons and horses of the team, tied up along a wall about 100 yards to the south. There, standing near the wagons, were several of the crew standing watch, continuing in their conversations as if nothing had happened. Heinrich then spotted Captain Artemis and Mr. Deeks, quickly approaching the opening of the cavern below, most likely attempting to ascertain the results of the first charge. Mr. Heinrich, did I hear you say that you saw the flare from the Exeter, bellowed Artemis from the ground below? Yes, sir, just a few minutes ago, he hollered. Good. What is the bearing on the Exeter? Heinrich looked out over the horizon with his binoculars, 120 degrees, southeast, sir. Very well, Mr. Heinrich. Keep your eyes open and hang on. We may have to set a second charge, cautioned Artemis, as he awaited word from Deeks and the rest of his crew in the vault below. Artemis had narrowed down his list of the best possibilities, from a list of hundreds of possible sites to the top ten most likely opportunities to find the treasure he sought. This site was number four on his list, chosen mainly for its ease of access. Years ago, his father had given him a faded map of the capital city, which an old friend of his had passed on to him. On the map, he swore, were sites that had been hastily utilized to safely store some of the excess gold reserves of the U.S. government, as well as many important historical documents that had been contained in the Washington, D.C. area in the weeks prior to Anastasia. The map, with handwritten anecdotes, had been the personal property of a man named General Mark Groves, who had been the Assistant Secretary of State at the time. Groves' original plan was to return to these sites after the flood to relocate everything that had been stored in the vaults to more secure facilities once the waters receded. Unfortunately, Groves was killed and unable to return. Mysteriously somehow, the map wound up in the hands of his grandfather, Robert Artemis. It was given to him while he oversaw food relief shipments along the West African coast as payment for a favor granted to a high-ranking officer of the United States Navy. How's it looking down the deeks, bellowed Artemis, standing at ground level above the exposed opening to the main vaults below the building. Almost got it, sir. One more charge should do the trick they tell me, suggested Deeks. I hope so, Deeks. This is our third vault today and we haven't had any luck yet. By the way... How are we set for charges? asked Artemis. We have enough charges for maybe one more attempt. That is, unless this vault proves tougher than I thought, replied Deeks. Damn, muttered Artemis, the next closest site is over two miles from here, and it's under the tunnel's Deeks. I don't want to go down there if we don't have to, explained Artemis. Deeks nodded his head slightly, I concur, continued Deeks, yelling loudly for everyone to hear him, Stand by for second charge in two minutes, he warned. Sir, any sign of the Exeter yet? Yes, Heinrich saw the flare about twenty minutes ago. What about the fortune, sir? Will we be rendezvousing with them later? Deeks asked, as he and the other men began climbing out from below. Artemis sighed. Well, Deeks, that depends. Depends on what, sir? On what we find here, replied Artemis. Deeks nodded to Artemis. One minute, sir. Let's get clear. Artemis followed Deeks and the other men as they ran to a safe distance from the building. Again, Heinrich heard the muffled thud of the explosion and then felt the vibrations of the ground shaking below him. 
Artemis and Deke stood at the opening of the cavern, awaiting word on the status of the vault as Mr. Langham and the other men went below to investigate the results. A few minutes later, they could see Langham appear from the opening, covered in dust and soot. She's open, sir, sputtered Langham, spitting dirt and dust out of his mouth. Come on in and take a look around. Artemis and Deeks were the first two to climb the over-rubble and into the small opening that led into the first of several large underground reinforced vaults. With oil lanterns lit, they crawled slowly in and cautiously looked around. At first, as their eyes began to slowly adjust to the darkness, Artemis worried that he had once again failed in his attempt to find the treasure he sought, as all he could see ahead of him were empty cases and shelves, stripped nearly bare, with the exception of a few scattered coins, pieces of paper, and other various artifacts that were probably of no great value, left on the floor and shelving no doubt in someone's haste to remove them. As Artemis searched the shelves and cases before him, holding his lantern out at arm's length, he felt a tapping on his shoulder from behind. Sir, over here, whispered Deeks, I think you should see this. Artemis followed Deeks through a doorway into a second room that was located on the far side of the first vault. This room was much larger than the first and apparently had been designed as an offloading area for large vehicles that at one time had underground access. In this room were two large vehicles that were still parked in the loading area, along with several steel crates all stacked around the vehicles. One crate had already been loaded inside the back of the first vehicle. As Deeks and Artemis shined their lanterns around inside the room, they spotted several rotted corpses lying against the smooth concrete walls. Each corpse was wearing a decayed uniform of some sort, and next to each of the corpses were several empty bottles, dishes, and eating utensils. Artemis examined one of the corpses with his lantern, their last supper, he sneered. Deeks continued examining several corpses as well as the crates that were loaded inside the vehicle. You don't suppose these men were caught in here in the last moments before the flood, do you? asked Deeks. Artemis nodded. They were in a hurry, and unfortunately for them, they were too late. Artemis shone his lantern over to one of the four steel crates that was still lying outside of the vehicle and tried to open it, but they were all tightly locked. Let's see if we can get one of these crates opened and see what's inside, suggested Artemis, as his heart began to beat faster. Deeks ran quickly back out to the opening of the vault and called out to one of the men for a crowbar. Here you go, Captain, said Deeks, handing Artemis the crowbar. He attempted to lift the crate for a moment, then realized how heavy it was he could barely budge it. Artemis's face was beaming now. He shoved the crowbar into a small crack between the lock on top of the crate and the lid and pulled down with all his weight, then Deeks joined in. With the combined weight of the two men, the old lock gave way and popped off to one side of the room. Artemis and Deeks dropped the crowbar and then looking at each other, let out a soft chuckle. Artemis reached over and flung open the lid of the crate, then grabbing their lanterns, the two men shone the light inside. Oh my God, exclaimed Deeks, sir, will you look at that? No wonder it's so heavy, it's going to take all of us to carry these. Stacked and packed in neat little rows, completely filling the entire space of the crate, lay several rows of solid gold bars. Each bar was clearly marked with a mint stamp to read, 400 ost fine gold, a serial number, and then the numbers 999.9 .9 stamped along the bottom. Artemis slowly nodded his head, looked up at Deeks, sighed and then smiled, well mister. Deeks, gather all the men, it's time to get these loaded up, and get the hell out of here. You have been listening to Caleb Elgin, The Rise of the Clans by David E. Farmer. Also available on Amazon Kindle. More chapters coming soon. Thank you for listening. Have a great day. Bye-bye.